Hi everyone, it's John. It's Tuesday, so I've got another book review for you today. Uh, before I get started, I did want to tell you I woke up at 5.30 this morning and had all four of my wisdom teeth removed. It was not an emergency or anything. I had had it planned for a month. But uh, just in case my speech sounds a little bit abnormal, I, I don't have much pain. Uh, I'm obviously deciding to record a book review, so I, I'm, I'm not hurting, but um, let me know how I sound. I think I sound okay, uh, but I just want to tell you that just in case you notice anything abnormal about the movement of my mouth or the words coming out of my mouth or whatever. Um, so the book I want to talk about today is um, called Black Boy by Richard Wright. Richard Wright was born in 1908 and died in 1960, I believe, yeah, 1960. Had to check the back. Um, and this book was actually originally published in 1945, right as World War II was ending. And in the last, you know, uh, I would say 30 or 40 years, Black Boy has become a central uh, work in the canon of African-American literature. Wright wrote uh, another book, called uh, Native Son, which has a similarly uh, vaunted status. Um, this was, uh, like I said, not published until 1945. I'll talk a little bit about the publishing history at the end of the review, because it was published in its original form in 1945, but not quite the, the form that Wright had wanted it uh, written in. This is, by the way, conceived to be something as an autobiography. Um, he never comes out and says it is pure autobiography, uh, sort of leaves the idea that it could have sort of a, a fictional patina to it, and the idea of the, the, the question to which it's pure autobiography remains a bit of a contested question. But with those sort of preliminary things in mind, uh, let me go ahead and tell you about my thoughts. So on reading a life like the one Richard the Wright present, Richard the Wright, Richard Wright presents here, it's hard to have any other reaction to this book other than just pure slack-jawed horror <laughs> at the contempt and disdain human beings can have for one another and how they treat one another. Childhoods like Richard Wright's uh, are the kind that just eat you alive and spit you out and chew you up. Um, his psychologically abusive father abandoned his mother, which forced him and his brother and his mother to uh, to move from place to place uh, in the United States, in with relatives, pushing them even further into poverty. Uh, Including uh, one one of the places he goes to lives he goes to live is with his grandmother, and then with his aunt, both of whom wield really weird pathological forms of like religious extremism toward him um, that are both damaging and and destructive and restrictive. Uh, but but despite all these advantages, <clears throat> uh, school kindles in young Richard uh, um, a raw admiration for the powers of language, which will eventually urge him to write his first story in a newspaper, which we'll learn about in the, uh, in the book, which is called, uh, the story is called The Voodoo of Hell's Half Acre. The second half of the novel sees Richard move to Memphis, and then eventually to Chicago. Uh, poverty and want, and this ubiquitous theme, uh, this sort of light return, uh, this reoccurring light motif of hunger, which keeps coming back throughout the book, um, always seems to linger like a like a haunting refrain in the background. But this is where, in the tradition of a true Bildungsroman, we we see the development of Richard's writing, his his reading and his, his political and intellectual life. The economic straits of the Great Depression see uh, Richard become interested in communism. Uh, it's probably somewhere in the 
late 1920s or early 1930s in the book. Of course, the Great Depression happening in <clears throat> 1929, starting then at least. Um, and, and he thinks that he can actually use communism as an entree into the political world to actually get some get some practice writing and to offer you know communist underground public publications his talent for writing. And while he does meet some of the first white people in his life who treat him fairly and who seem to have no ulterior motives in treating him fairly, uh, he quickly finds out that the maison scene of Chicago communism is just as populated with human fear and malice and the, the hunger for power um, that the rest of the people in his life are. Despite his interests having made him a reader and a political person in the first place, he suspected within that group of uh, Chicago communists that he's running with uh, of being an intellectual and of being a Trotskyite, which would be two Stalinist synonyms of the time of, of basically being a subverter or a counter-revolutionary. And he ends up basically leaving the party, the lead, leaving the party uh, un frustrated and discontented. And thus the novel basically kind of ends right there. Um, almost in media race, uh, not, not exactly with much of a resolution, but with Richard still determined to become a writer, having been politically um, upset uh, in a way, but really with all of his future ahead of him. I would say that the novel really ends with him in his mid-twenties somewhere, maybe uh, mid to early twenties. So. Um, maybe somewhere around the peak of the Great Depression. One of the most fascinating aspects of the novel isn't really what is presented in the novel itself to readers, but rather what's uncovered in knowing a little about the novel's publishing history. So I want to share that with you, too. Um, only the first 14 chapters which were collectively titled Part One Southern Night, were originally published in 1945. That first book, published in 1945, was only the first 14 chapters of the origin of uh, the the entire book as Richard Wright conceived it. Wright had originally written six more chapters, uh, which was Part Two, called uh, The Horror and the Glory. But the Book of the Month Club, which uh, Wright correctly recognized as an influential literary tastemaker, wasn't interested in the second part. They said, we'll take the book, we'll, we'll publish it, we'll, we'll, we won't publish it, but if you, if you do get it published, we want it in our book club, but only the first part. Second part, we, we won't take it. So he said, okay. You know, knowing how much money this can bring in, and by the way, they had done the same thing with his native son in 1940. They took his native son, and he probably made a really nice chunk of change off of that uh, Book of the Month Club deal. So knowing what he what he could make, he probably said, okay, um, wrote those last six chapters, had them written anyway, kept them in his desk eventually hoping that they would get published in a final version one day eventually and just kind of hoped for the best but took the check in the meantime which is probably what I would have done too. Um, it wasn't until 1991 really really hard to imagine <laughs> after all the uh, waiting that he had to do he died in 1960 okay he really died before any substantive civil rights legislation was even passed in the United States. And then he had to wait. Well, he didn't wait since he died in 1960. But, I mean, he, <clears throat> Americans would have to wait another 25 years after that civil rights legislation to, to actually see the book in its final form. Uh, the book did not appear, as we know it today, this book, with chapters 1 and 2, 
published between the same cover until 1991. That's 46 years after he wrote the book. Did it actually appear this way? Almost half a century. And that, by the way, was not until the the really groundbreaking um, literary work and, and the guiding hand of the Stanford uh, literary scholar Arnold Rampersand, who uh, who is a a, a very well-known scholar. Uh, well, like I said, works at Stanford, a scholar of uh, Black and African American literature. One of the book's editors, the uh, famous social reformer of the first half of the 20th century by the name of Dorothy Canfield Fisher, wrote Wright several times telling him that the ending of the novel ended on too pessimistic of a note and would therefore put off many white readers. And she, she begged Richard Wright to, to keep in mind those well-intentioned liberal white readers and sec suggested that failing to pat them on their back for their efforts made his novel somehow weaker. Ma made his novel somehow weaker and, and less likely to see publication. And I don't think that was a threat. That was just a, that was um, not a threat, not a promise, but just saying, you know, I mean, e even that, even that establishment liberal Northeastern white mindset wants to be congratulated for thinking what it does. Keep in mind this was in 1940. I, I guess uh, that's what passed for liberal attitudes towards race relations in those days. <laughs> but um, I just imagine having to wait half a century to see your work published the way that it was always, that you always meant to see it, that you always wanted it to be seen by readers. And half of that time was after the destruction of the, of the Jim Crow South and, and the passage of the Civil Rights legislation. Like I said, he didn't have to wait since he had already died in 1960, but the fact that it wasn't worked on immediately, of course work like this does take years, but um, I hope it didn't take 25 years. Um, <laughs> I would have, you know, loved the idea to see this much, much sooner than 1991. It's true that the, the degree to which Wright's uh, narrative is really an autobiography in the truest, unadorned sense of the word. Like I said, it, it's sort of a matter of contestation. Uh, certainly no one reading the story of Richard Wright's boyhood would ever wish it even on their worst enemy. But it was, for better or worse, Wright's artistic vision, construe those words how you will, um, of an American hunger, which is the subtitle of the book. Just imagine having to fight your way out of your family's religious bigotry, having to fight your way through an encounter full of copious other kinds of bigotry, and then be told, once your book is complete, once your vision is finished, once it's finally crafted, and you have no more to say, that you failed because you haven't sufficiently congratulated, that you haven't sufficiently uh, been gracious enough to these liberal, supportive white people. Uh, if that suggestion combined with the raw cruelty, bitterness, and poverty presented in the novel doesn't make your blood boil uh, so much that you want to stroke out, then maybe nothing can. Richard Wright, Black Boy, uh, an American classic. Go pick it up. I don't know how familiar uh, people are going to be with Richard Wright or this novel or Native Son, his other book, outside of the United States. But uh, he is considered, and I don't know if I mentioned this uh, in the video earlier, he is considered a, a seminal figure in 20th century black literature, black American literature. And um, 
truly an eye-opening book. Do, do yourself a favor and go read it. I will see you next Tuesday.